on the eleventh hour of the eleventh day of the eleventh month. The guns lining the bloody trenches that scarred Europe ceased. It was a war to end all wars. If only that turned out to be true. Sergeant John R. Macy. Sergeant Alan A. Greco. From 5 a.m. this morning until 11 a.m. Corporal Tanner J. O'Leary. They were reading the names of those who had been killed in action from Operation Enduring Freedom and Iraqi Freedom. No sores, no, nothing draining though? Nothing draining, no. You never really think about losing body parts and stuff when you're about to go off the war. You think about either dying or you get your will in place and all that stuff, but you don't really think about coming back with a lifelong injury. And during these wars, there's a 99% survival. So there's a lot of us back. Can you be eating okay? I have pride that I'm a veteran. It made me a better person. And I'm not uh, afraid to show my pride for uh, the country that I love and the country that raised me to be who I am. It's 11-11-11. It used to be Armistice Day, but then Emporia, Kansas, they decided they they decided to rename it Veterans Day, and now that's how Veterans Day got founded. For nearly 90 years, we have tended to the memory of men and women who put on the uniform of this great country, served, were wounded, or died in the service of everybody who sits here today. Somebody has to raise their hand. Somebody has to say, yes, I'll go do it. And I'll put the uniform on, and I'll protect our way of life. To all my fellow veterans out there, today's our day, right? We're standing on the uh, field of Shiloh, the battlefield of Shiloh in southwestern Tennessee. A uh, landscape uh, in which two-day struggle in the Civil War occurred in April of 1862. It's a national military park managed by the National Park Service and National Park System, set aside in 1894 by the generation that fought the battle that fought the Civil War. If you were to drop that generation on this landscape, they would know exactly where they were and be able to tell you the experiences that they had here on April 6th, 7th of 1862. Fire! Shiloh is truly a gut-wrenching battle. From the inside, Shiloh must have looked like Armageddon. 110,000 participants in the fight, the first such large titanic battle of a war. It will be a bloodbath, a carnage on both sides. Fire! Casualties will be immense. Entire organizations will disappear in the two days of fighting. Fire! Even officers who might have had previous combat experience were not prepared for what they saw at Shiloh. Men blown to pieces, the entire sections totally eliminated. These were casualties this nation had never seen, experienced, or even anticipated would unfold in the war that was now waging throughout the country. In two days of fighting here on Shiloh Hill, the total Union and Confederate casualties, 23,746. And it sent shockwaves into every community, every home, north and south. General Grant really had a health and a sanitation issue. Getting those men buried as quickly as possible was paramount in his mind.
is only after the war that people start wanting to remember the sacrifice of the men that fell here at Shiloh, both north and south. Our nation's first national cemeteries are a direct result of the Civil War. And Shiloh, here overlooking the Tennessee River, is certainly one of the more serene. Many people say one of the prettiest of those. But for those that participated in it, it always had a special place. And a battle of this magnitude clearly had a life-changing effect on these soldiers. They wanted their Congress to set this land aside so that the land would always be preserved. That is a charge we still have today to preserve their memory, preserve the history of the battle here on the ground it occurred. I came to Shiloh Battlefield because it's 11, 11, 11. That happens once in a lifetime. And the kids said, Mama, we need to do something. So we came to Shiloh. There's probably bodies that were buried all over this park that were not found that are still on this park. To me, the entire park is hallowed ground from that reason. The Civil War is the most important single event in our nation's history. The men that fought were fighting for decisions about how the country would develop and what we would become. Places like this, mean a lot to me because of where our country's going. I want my children to know that there are people that have given their life for causes and things that they believe so strongly about. This is a battleground that we're on. Everything we've been about has been walking across battleground where there have been soldiers fighting for their lives. And that's something that we take for granted too many times. So we need to remember the sacrifice that they took on that day and that year. Oh yeah, dinner time. MRE. Oh, I got the sloppy joke. I'm sure World War II didn't have stuff like this. Uh, no. Man, open that for me. Oh, no. Chipotle snack bread. Oh, that's Ooh. nasty. I was a mess sergeant, and I got to make our own menus and everything else. When I first arrived in Afghanistan, uh, we went to our little fire base that uh, had no power, no water, just a little mud hut on the side of the mountain where occasionally they'd uh, drop uh, giant cases of MREs and water, and we ate nothing but these for 45 days. Yep. There's no such thing as a good MRE after a week of eating them straight. When we get together, we talk about our service, where we were, the things we went through because we have a unique experience as veterans. I'm here because I want everybody to know our stories. I've got to the point where I'm at because of the vets before me. I want everybody to know that every one of us has a story and we're not just the uniform. We're people underneath it. I've always been fascinated by the military in general, um, veterans, what their particular stories are. Just any veteran, doesn't matter if you were Navy, Air Force, Marine, we all share the same common bond because there are certain things that we experience that other people have no idea what that feels like. It goes all the way back, all the way back to the Revolutionary War. You can't forget your past. That's something that I, will enforce on my children is understanding the history of America and what so many people have given to give us what we have today and 
the accomplishments and, and hardships that they had to face. The guy was, he's been missing for 128 years and nobody even knew or cared that he was there. I just, I'm very an emotional guy. This is a Medal of Honor winner laying here, you know. Not every soldier in the Civil War did what he did. And that becomes even more important to try to find out where he was buried. Frederick C. Anderson, a Congressional Medal of Honor winner. They've been looking for him for years and uh, started at Somerset. You know, there was, there was newspaper articles, him being out of Providence. And he also has a statue over in Raynham, Mass. I was determined to find his gravesite, no matter what. My name is Charlie McGazel, I'm from Pawtucket. I'm 80 years old, I'm a Korean War veteran. I was in the occupation of Germany in 1950-52-53. I was on a website searching for some Medal of Honor people in Rhode Island, and I found a website called Medal of Honor Lost Through History. So I opened that up and I found the link of this like 451 people on there, and one of the top persons was a guy named Anderson. I've lived with this guy every night in bed for the past six months. I went to uh, historical sites, uh, historical centers, libraries, uh, town halls, looking through uh, death records, birth records, uh, census records, whatever they had there, whatever I could find. And we would go through the, the dates of when he, when he got the medal, looking for something, when he died. This is the return of death. This is the one that gave me the clue of where he died and was buried. Down at the bottom here, you see he's buried in Dighton, Mass. It's signed by the undertaker and the coroner. So slowly but surely, all these uh, stories started coming up where we, you know, places that he's been at. So we're slowly trying to piece this whole thing together. Uh, maybe a week later, I got a call from Woody saying, we found your man. I found him. Please come forward. It's a thing I have to do. I have to do it. I keep looking and looking until it's done with. I try to imagine the, the, the day they bury this person, the sadness, the people around there crying for this person, and, and now he's forgotten. Nobody, nobody knows. People drive up and down the cemeteries and they pass his grave every day, but just they didn't know who he was or what, why he was there. I don't know what to say anymore. I just, I'm glad it's over with now, my part of it. He belongs to the town now. And they'll, they'll take care of him. Good morning, how are you all this morning? Welcome to the World War I Museum. Happy birthday for the Marine Corps. Thank you for your service. Welcome home also. My name is Bob Dudley. Welcome to the museum. Have you been here before? Volunteer here at the World War I Museum. I'm spending Veterans Day down here with veterans. World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. How are you all today? I love soldiers the camaraderie. 1 July 1916. And the brotherhood I see in, in the veterans is very important. When World War I started in 1914, what do you think the major weapon was? Any veteran who has been uh, in the service, in combat, can really come into the World War I Museum and see themselves. The battles that they went through, the trenches that you fought in, these specific items may be a little older, but they've all gone through the mechanisms to get into the military, trained up, 
go fight and come home. Sir, how you doing today? Welcome home. I'm a retired field artillery colonel. Snipers or counterfire? Spent a little over 29 years in the Army. Both my mother and father had served during World War II. Most of their friends had. I always grew up believing that I should support my country. Enlisted in July 1968. A lot of my contemporaries were in Vietnam and I was in college, I didn't think that was right. I went to Vietnam, I was a Ford observer, a fire direction officer, an executive officer in an artillery unit up on the demilitarized zone. 25 March 1971, Long Bay, Vietnam, out by Laos. It's a day burned in my, in, in my mind because we barely survived. Today, we recognize our veterans coming home. Uh, they have parades, they, they have folks lined up in the airports walking them home. Unfortunately, with the Vietnam generation, we were not welcomed home, there were no parades. Uh, I was spit on coming home. That, that was a kick in the teeth. And today, when you see Vietnam veterans, and when you greet each other, they say, welcome home. Sir, how you doing today? Welcome home. Thank Thanks you, for your service. Appreciate That's because no one else ever welcomed us home. And so the Vietnam veteran welcomes each other home. Veterans Day started off as Armistice Day from World War I. To me, it, it's really a special day because it is the country recognizing uh, the cost of freedom and realizing that all the stuff that we do, whether it's uh, Occupy New York or Occupy Wall Street or whether it's uh, freedom of the press, whatever it is, uh, it all comes at a price. It's important for the youth of America to see what the cost has been uh, for the country that they live in. People that end up being heroes is, the, is their hero because of the way they reacted under circumstances that they didn't create and maybe they didn't even anticipate opportunity for heroics you never know when it's gonna arise but it's ordinary people doing extraordinary feats just an everyday thing that i done and uh, sometimes we had to walk through four feet of snow to get from one mess hall up to the other and was it uphill both ways <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> And that's what I think most people don't get. It's, it's not the people you see all the time on the TV. It's everybody is behind that person kicking down the door. It's a mess sergeant who fed him. It's the mechanic who got him the truck to get there. It's everybody is involved in that person on the front line and people don't think about that. But there's a lot of people it takes just to get that one person forward. I'm in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. And I'm okay with it. Because that's the inherent risk of my job as an infantryman. But no one drafted me. I raised my hand. I had a longtime colleague of mine, hunting partner and, and military colleague, who was a pilot in World War II. He won two Navy crosses. The only thing he'd ever say about it was, well, I just did what was needed to be done. And he said it was just the fact that I was there. Absolutely. I might say a lot of heroes are victims of circumstances. They just happened to be there when they were called on to do something and they had the fortitude to be able to do it. You can't escape it. There's too many reminders. I do have uh, people walk up to me, thank me for my service. It's just an experience. Once you've been there, it, it don't go away. 
Today I've had people call me hero and I don't, I don't feel that way. I'm real thankful that I, did, that I come home without even a scratch. The 8th Air Force, based in England as a single unit, suffered more casualties than any other single unit during World War II. Before we left the States, I, I flew and trained as a tail gunner on B-17 Flying Fortress. The position I flew was right back here in the very tail end. I could see where we'd, where we'd been, and that was the position I flew in 31 times. My wife's name was Twyla, and uh, she was a real pretty girl, and things just kind of clicked. And nine months later to the day, we was married. After I flew my first mission, I knew I was, I wished I'd could have done something else. We come back from one mission, was the only, only plane in our squadron that made it back. I know it wasn't a pleasant time for her in that, in that period of time. Twilo wrote, I married a kind, affectionate young man. I did not marry a soldier. Three years later, the Air Force sent home a basket case, a bundle of nerves. He's been fighting the war ever since. I'm ready for the war to end. I want my kind, caring, affectionate husband back. It makes me sad that I had to affect her feelings up like that, but I don't know what else I could have done. I just, I was a different person when I come back from war. There's things that happen that you just can't forget. It's there and it ain't gonna go away. If I'm a hero, there's thousands of other guys that should be heroes too. No hero. A veteran is an American who served in his country at a time when others would not and went where others were afraid to go. He wore the uniform proudly and who either came home or did not. They are American veterans. Bo Greitz, Lieutenant Colonel, United States Army Special Forces. I've got uh, 10 bronze stars, five silver stars. General Westmoreland signed uh, Soldier's Medal. Captain James uh, Greitz Infantry for wounds received in action. I have six uh, crosses of gallantry. Gold Medal of Cambodia. I've never known an officer that ever won a medal by himself. I've had generals ask me, Bo, why do you wear all of your ribbons? To me, it represents the sweat, the blood, the tears, the camaraderie, how hard we tried, how some died, and I would be decorated. It represents my men, both living and dead, and I will wear every decoration, every opportunity I get, not to make myself look good, but in remembrance of what we did together. I think something that's been a part of America really since its inception and still continues today is that regardless of who you are, you've, you've faced certain oppressions or discrimination, but the overriding value that uh, has really contributed to everybody uh, choosing to enlist is a love of country, you know, despite having difficulties in the United States, you know, these people love the United States, we love the United States, and 
we believe in its values and ideals and are willing to fight for it. Yeah, I'm, I'm part Native American. I have a lot of friends from the tribe who joined. And if you follow the history back, uh, there was a lot of injustices done. I had personal uh, close relationship with some of the inequities that had been put upon our Japanese citizens at the beginning of uh, immediately after Pearl Harbor. You had the 442nd Combat Regimental Combat Team, which was the most highly decorated uh, unit in World War II that was all Japanese. And so you have people there that even though they were under extreme uh, discrimination and their parents were actually interned and they were serving this country. I think some were eager to serve just to, like the Tuskegee Airmen, to prove that they, they were intelligent enough to fight, they were intelligent enough to fly, and to prove people wrong. That's one of the great things about the military is it, it pulls from everybody and regardless of who you are or where you come from or, or what your history is, you want to be a part of it. And that's what gets so many different people working together in the military that never would otherwise because there's that pull regardless. We eat them, hoop it. We're not warriors, but if we're punched, we will fight back. This is really a place of honor that I keep my, my father's flag. This flag uh, covered his casket. Every Veterans Day, I usually fly this. Good morning, Hunter. Good morning, Zoe. Let's go put the flag up this morning. I need you to stand on this side. Don't touch the ground, but hold it. Make sure it don't touch. He was a World War II veteran. The flag is up today. I hope he has served from World War I, World War II, Korean conflict, Vietnam and the present, and hope he, they've served as coat talkers. I think the Marines are important to my family. Maybe it was because of me. I joined the Marine Corps because they told me that it was rough and tough, and I said, well, I'll take that on. Hopis historically in prehistoric times have avoided conflicts as much as they possibly could. But when it comes to a point where they have to defend themselves, they, they, they are able defenders. My letters are from my daughter. She's in the United States Marine Corps boot camp right now. She graduates December 2nd. It says, Dear Mother Smith, I love you. And I'm hanging in there. I can't believe I'm halfway done. Hurrah. Well, I gotta go for now. I love you, mother. You're my number one. XOXL Legacy. Thank you, Bob, for coming out and supporting uh, Veterans Day, all the veterans. Hi, from the Hopi Reservation, it's Officer Begay saying hello. Hi. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We appreciate you guys, everybody, for coming out. We support you, veterans. Thank you. <laughs> okay, this is the Hopi High Royalty. All right.
Thanks for our country's freedom. Thank you for coming out. I'm defending the homeland. I'm defending my way of life. I'm defending Hopis. And a lot of Hopis here are defending, defending Hopis. The, the ability to uh, do something for someone, in this case, do something great for the country and walk away say, you know, I helped. I was just saying the drill instructors told us to go make phone calls, tell our parents that we arrived safely at boot camp and not having a telephone on reservation, I went and just stood there and made belief I was going to go call, but there was nobody to call at home. We didn't have phone. We eat them so As warriors, we have fought in battles, but as Hopi, we prefer peace. It's a wonderful day. You all have a flag. Oh, thank you very much. You got it. Are you a veteran? Yes, U.S. Army. Here. From 1955 to 1975. Yeah. I went to Vietnam once. Yeah. 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 It's just one bright day. It's just like uh, celebrating your birthday or celebrating your anniversary day. It just one of those very important days. It's a Veterans Day, and I'm very proud of this day. I always want to participate. My name is Richard H. Dickey. I joined the Army in 1955, and I served 20 years. I was born in Hawaii in 1935. My father was Japanese. He came as a group immigrant from Japan to establish a new life in Hawaii. He was a cameraman. He does a graduation picture, a wedding picture. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii by air. President Roosevelt has just announced. When the Pearl Harbor attack happened, we were visiting my grandmother. It's called St. Louis High. It's above on, in the mountain, and you could see straight down to Pearl Harbor. I was pulling my grandma's dress saying, is that 4th of July? But she said, no, we were getting attacked, and I don't know what that meant at that time. I was only six years old. This is the perimeter over which armed guards kept a 24-hour watch. We were interned later part of the year in 1942. We had no choice. Here is a party of women and children arriving in Crystal City following their voluntary decision to join husbands and fathers in detention. Practically all the children and many women were American born. It's incredible. This is one of the community bathhouses. My mother, she was not bitter at all. My father was a very bitter man because he just took his life away. They just want to get away from the United States. And in 1945, we went straight to Japan. When we got off the boat, it was a devastated place. And all we could see is all the buildings demolished. The living condition was terrible. There was no heat in the house. The only heat we had during the winter time was the small hibachi. It was terrible. My father was born in Nagasaki, and all his relatives was in Nagasaki. He was trying to get back to Nagasaki. So my father said, let's go. Just me and my father said, let's go find 
my family. When we arrived to Nagasaki, we had to walk. When we came to behind the hill, we turned around and all the sunny. This thing is in my head all the time. He just fell down on his knees and started crying. Because when I looked over there, all the house was gone. I knew right there, all his relatives was dead. And I just can't forget that sight. So I finally told my father, come on, let's go home. So finally got up, he was just on his knees, just crying. So we got up, went back to Straits and I went back to Kyoto. It was, it was tough, yeah. I don't think my father was happy at all after that. I just can't forget that. Uh, it was, a, it was tough. Sorry about that. As I was growing up as little, we spoke English, and going to school was very difficult. Everybody spoke Japanese, and my English, it just faded away. Forgot all about it. I was going to uh, school in Kyoto, and I just passed the exam to go into college. And I got this draft letter from Hawaii saying that when you finish your schooling, you'll be drafting in service. And I had to talk to my father because he did not want me to leave. And I told my father, I want to see the world. So, so finally, he let me go. I have to appreciate my parents. They did not take my United States citizenship away. And when the draft letter came, it just turned around. My uh, life, August the 1st, 1955, I joined the Army. This is the picture here when I made my first uh, EA, top grade of the United States Army. Being in the U.S. Army and serve your country, and it was a wonderful experience. How you doing, sir? How you doing? Have a flag. Oh, I was proud to be an American citizen. Yeah. There's no way I would have stayed in Japan. Very rewarding thing to be a veteran. You feel proud that you serve the country. You protect the country. You've done your job as a citizen of the United States. And it's very, very rewarding. Hi, ma'am. Have a flag. Happy Veterans Day. Thank you for your service. Thank you very much. There isn't a day that goes by mm -hmm. that I don't think of my friends that I lost. I've lost 37. Yeah, I'm up to 19 now. Wow, that's a lot. I've held seven as they died in my arms. Well, you mourn for a while, and then you figure out, well, you can't do this. You just got to keep going. And so it's better to get out and start doing things. I send flowers. I make my annual calls to my certain ones, not everybody. I don't think I could survive calling 37 families. But certain ones I, I contact. I wear this. <laughs> It only has one name on it, but it stands for a lot of people. I look at it whenever I'm having a hard time, and it gives me power to push a little harder and keep going.
imagine being on the other end of that in the dark when they shoot at you with 30 round clip. They got 40 and 50 round clips for that thing. They shoot at us in Vietnam with. I mean, that much firepower, that's one guy. When I got out as, and got discharged as a 19-year-old, I was a mess. I was big time hurting. I started drinking, trying to forget. Fall of 69, I started college, and I took an overdose. And my goal was at 33, and I was thinking Jesus was on the cross at 33. I was going to shoot myself. I, I, I planned it at midnight, end it. And this pastor, and he asked me if I'd like to accept Jesus, which I, I did, and I remember crying so hard. And the next day, I, I slept there, and the next day I started church and going to Bible studies. My name is Jeffrey Steiner. I live in Cushing, Minnesota. It's right in the center of the state, big town of 65 people, and, and I have 100 acres. The, it's called the Veterans National Living Memorial here. I was two, two months into my 18th birthday when I landed on the DMZ in Vietnam, in the Marines. And a month later, I was in the worst battle of the 10-year war, the Tet. I was, one of, I was a survivor. When I bought this land, there was only two pine trees, and I always wanted a forest. So when I moved up here, I used to take buckets and drive along power lines where the babies are growing up and they're gonna burn them off, dig them up, put them in a bucket, bring them back. I know the spot where I was on my hands and knees planting, digging the hole to put the tree in. And I never knew this until somebody said, you know, you were crying then. That your, your first tears, that first tree you decided this watered, the, watered the, that tree. And I go, I never looked at that before. It comes back. I can be out doing stuff and all of a sudden I'll think of things, especially when I'm on my hands and my knees planting a tree for everyone who died in the Vietnam War. Or I think of a letter I get from a mother who's lost a son, so would you plant this tree in honor of so and so and say a prayer for him? Donnie Severson's tree, planted back in 80, I don't know, 85 or 6. He died in Vietnam, saving a whole bunch of guys being medevaced off a hill, holding off the NVA. And he just kept keeping the NVA firing on him until they killed him. My son Donnie, age 20, was killed in, in action in Vietnam on July 22, 1970. He was awarded many medals, but they never meant a lot to me, knowing that there is a tree growing in his memory means everything. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for what you are doing. I love you, Mrs. Donnie Severson. Today's no November 11, 11, 11. It's his 11th month, 11th day, 2011. I'll plant these 11 trees in honor of somebody we lost in the Vietnam War. The ground's hard. When the guys die, they're laying down horizontal, and these trees stand up for them. Come here, Cheyenne. Let me have your scarf. Come here. Come here, girl. I want to put this here for the last one. So when I come by, I can remember this. Thank you, girl. My goal was to have this touch other veterans that, hey, look at this guy, he cared, you know? He did this for us, um, you know, in some small way. Obviously, today is uh, Veterans Day. Very emotional situation, very emotional time. Uh, a lot of us have known Ryan for a long time. Ryan was a great kid. He helped out with everything. He did what he could for everyone. 
he wanted them to be the best they could be as well as he be the best he could be. It was always a fun time when Ryan was around. He was kind of the kid I looked up to coming into high school. He was just around my size, everything acted just like me. Everybody called me Little Larson. He was one of those kids that, he was never tired. He always wanted to do more, he always wanted to give more. And uh, that's the, the thing about Ryan Larson that really sticks in my mind. He was a good boy. And we loved him so much. He wanted to be a soldier so bad. And he said he wanted to serve our country and keep us all safe. At first it was a shock. Uh, the kids, the parents, um, the, the faculty members here. It happened right at the end of, after the end of school, so everyone was on summer break. I got a text from one of my friends asking if I knew Ryan Larson, and I said, yeah. And they said, well, I just heard he was killed in Afghanistan. And when I found out what happened, I just kept asking why it was him. There were two other guys, I think, in the striker with him, and those guys are lucky to be alive, and I'm glad, but, I mean, he was just one of the unlucky, and I, I really wish it wasn't him. Of course, we're still upset with what happened, but we know that Ryan would have wanted us to push on. A Veterans Day as a whole means a lot. It reminds me of everybody who's put their lives out there, but this Veterans Day is more important to me than any other, just because there's been finally someone that I knew that has been affected, and it's affected so many of us. We all lost someone special this June when Private Ryan Larson was killed while serving our country. Everybody says it's just another day that we should always thank our veterans and that's true. But the day that you realize that you're missing something that's always been there, it really hits home. When they say make the ultimate sacrifice, it's us down here that's making it too because it hurts so bad. He died doing what he wanted to do, so um, with that, you know, yeah, I smile because I know he, he served his life the way he wanted to serve it. Life is too short to just sit by idly, so I truly believe uh, Adam's friendship area is better because of Ryan Larson. from week to week, a lot of times day by day. I know where I'm gonna be, but I don't turn that page till that morning. We traveled throughout the state of Illinois from top to bottom, east to west. There'll be roughly about 60 showings this year with about 30,000 miles covered. There's days that you go down the road, yes, it goes through your mind. My son's on one side of the trailer and yes, he's Watch me every day I go down the road. On 11, 11, 11, put this special day into their mind, stop and say thank you. Just pick it up and carry it like that. I'm Donald Paneer from Washburn, Illinois. My father was in World War II in the Southwest Pacific. I personally wasn't in the military, but I know what it's all about. My son's name is Philip J. Panier. He passed away in January of 2008 as specialist, Philip J. Panier. He is from out of Fort Campbell, Kentucky. We lost him in Iraq. As of the present day, there's 261 on the wall. The wall covers Operation Enduring Freedom Iraq, Operation Enduring Freedom Afghanistan. <laughs> They're always somebody's kid. <laughs> Port 
importance of being here that at any school, including Hampshire High School, is to educate the young people that we do have fallen from the state of Illinois. It's so sad. Another girl, my God, they're everywhere. Let the general people know that this is why we have the freedom we have today. It's a lot of people. It's so sad that all these people go to war and then they die for us. And this gentleman here is coming in O'Hare Airport this afternoon. You have a lot of young men that have lost their life for what they thought was right. They're awful young, the majority of them. I looked at that and I could see the youth in their faces. I think it is very powerful. I think the idea behind it is very, very good to keep it in people's minds. When we're doing the service, I was never in the service. My son's on the wall. That's why. I'm, oh, uh, he is. Well, yeah. yes. gosh. Yeah. What a great uh, testimony yeah. to the yeah. young man. That's very nice. Yeah. I'm doing it for all. I'm not just my son. Well, all. That's okay. He did it for everybody too. Well, that's correct. That's correct. I've been crying since the walk in this morning. Yeah. Yeah, it's really. It's really something. Is this your only son? I've got two living boys, yes. Yeah. I, I lost my oldest and youngest. Oh my goodness. I lost him in the service. The other one committed suicide five months ahead of that. Dale was in the National Guard Reserves for six years. And so we had a full military funeral for him. The guy above is guiding me every day. Otherwise, you know. You do have to have me. Yeah. It's sad. It makes me feel like that could be my dad or my brother, someone I love. So it just really exemplifies the respect that I feel for these men and women fighting for our country. You see a veteran in the street, acknowledge him. Tell him thank you. I think he's just as much of a hero as everyone else is because he's able to share his son's story and have his legacy live on and hopefully more young men and women will act accordingly and appreciate our country as they should. You're good. You're good. Thank you. He'd probably tell me if he was alive, Dad, what are you doing this for? Because he never did like me to put him up on a pedestal and show him off. but. He's up there looking down at me, and I'm just going to say, well, Dad's got to do it. And I'm sure he'd understand. I think the, the experience that we all share is that in being veterans, that we, we know what it is to have each other's back. When you're really under fire, and, and especially when you're under fire repeatedly over a time, the bond that, that you make, you know, uh, we were so closely knit, and especially the ones that, that you know, I, I fought and bled and cried and died with, you know. We had people that we had to depend on like they were our true brothers, and, and some more than we did on our, our immediate bloodline. There isn't anything like that closeness that you get you know, being that close to the edge. It 
it's the hardest thing I've ever had to do. And he said, Mom, it's okay, it'll be fine. I'll be fine, everything's gonna be fine. I just put him in God's hands. So we started the adventure of becoming a Marine. He signed up June 18, 2008. And on June 20th, 2008, his best friend, like a brother, he was in Afghanistan and he was blown up by an IED and he ended up losing both legs. And it was like, Colton, see, this is what can happen. This is real. It's not just, let's go play war. This is what's happening. That was gonna be his life from the time he was 10 or 11 years old. That's what he picked out. And uh, when he got to high school, we thought, well, maybe it'll, it'll burn out change his mind because we was worried about the war going on and all that stuff and but he never he never changed he just said dad don't worry about it. everything's gonna be all right knowing where he was going praying every day that he would you know everything was gonna be all right and he come back and without any injuries, just be back to normal life. But, you know, the outcome was different, but, you know, he died doing what he loved to do. He, he wouldn't, he'd never change that for nothing in the world. He'd get up and he'd do it all over again. I mean, that's just what kind of young man he was. And there's a lot of them out there like that. picked to be a dog handler, he thought that was the greatest thing in the world. He just loved doing it. You know, what's going on when, you know, the bullets are flying and everything else is, it's a man, you know? You know, I told him, I said, well, that just puts another bullseye on your back as far as the en enemy-wise. And he said, I know, he said, but I'm not worried about it. To be a Marine Corps dog handler, that was the number one thing in his life at the time. I was behind him 110%. I suppose you can go all the way back in history as far as you want, and dogs have been used in time of war. The United States military didn't start using the dogs until 70 years ago during World War II. That was the first time they created the war dog program. Dogs, they're serving in war just like the human is. They know the dangers of war, they experience death. So a dog is actually a veteran after the war because if he lives through all that, he has that distinction of also being a veteran because he served in the battlefield. I was a scout dog handler during the Vietnam War. I had two German Shepherd scout dogs, Clipper and Timber. This dog was like your right arm. He was like your brother. He was, he was a, you know, if you were married, he was like a wife to you because you were bonding with that dog so much. The difficult thing about the Vietnam War was the fact that we did not bring all the dogs back. It was a type of situation where the military could pretty much do what they wanted with them. They did not repatriate them to the United States. They euthanized them because they were classified as government equipment and they did not want to transfer those dogs out of that country. When you left that dog and you had to rotate back to the United States because you survived the war, Saying goodbye to your dog was the most difficult thing you can possibly do. It's like 
a, a, a divorce. It's like a, a you, you're leaving him, you feel sorry for him, and you carry him in your heart for, for the rest of your life. And that was 43 years ago. Good boy. Today, the military working dog program is so much different than we had in Vietnam. We have an adoption system it's that if a dog is of retirement age and no longer capable of working his job, they can actually adopt him to a family that's willing to take him on. And these dogs today are not treated like they were in Vietnam. He got with Eli, and all of a sudden the pictures started coming in. And this is just one of my favorite because it's like both of them are smiling. He was just so happy. They just loved each other so much. It's just like they're meant to be together. Anyway, it's my favorite picture. I was proud that he was a Marine and that he had accomplished what he set out to, to become. But as a mom, I was also scared because I knew what could happen. Dog handlers in Afghanistan, they're out in the open. The enemy knows they're finding their IEDs. They put bigger targets on their back. You know, they, they try to kill the dogs, they try to kill the handlers. We got bingo, boys. There was a bomb there. They were on patrol, had three trucks in a convoy. Colton was in the first truck, second truck hit an IED. Everybody stopped, Colton and Eli get out and clear the area around their truck. And Eli lays down on another IED, finds another IED. He walks back past the IED, said everything's good, and that's when he was shot. He pretty much was a target that day. He comes to mama, because <laughs> mama doesn't make him do all that stuff. <laughs> Today, when a dog handler is killed in combat, the family gets the first option to adopt that animal. So it means a lot to that family to have something connected to their son while he was in combat and he died with that dog being present. They said when Colton didn't make it, that Eli would go lay on Colton's cot and he was grieving too. He wanted his best friend back. So that was Colton's love and I just could not wait to touch him because that was the last thing Colton touched. It's like you just want to hold him and I look into his eyes all the time and I wish Eli could talk. <laughs> Tell me stories. Come up. He's a lot of comfort to the family and <sighs> he kind of knows when you're down in the dumps and he'll come over and jump up in your lap or want to play and you know like come on let's go outside let's go do something. Don't sit here and mope the rest of your life. I'm up. I don't want people to think the dog replaces my son because, you know, that'll never happen. But I guess it's something that we can give our love to and we can hold on to something. <laughs> Everything that we've ever done or been invited to has been a blessing. People, they're our healing process. Walking to honor the work and dedication of military working dogs each of which, on an average, saved 150 lives during their tour of active duty. Please welcome the families of fallen handlers, Colton Rusk and Billy Krause, along with military working dog Eli, who was assigned to Colton Rusk and adopted by his family. These are people that are truly proud to be Americans. These are all canines. I'm strong when I'm around people like this. This makes me strong. When I'm at home, I'm not. Reality hits and I realize what I lost. But out here, it gives me a reason that I realize that, that, that um, he died for a reason. He died so we can do this. And I usually don't cry in front of people. But it means a lot to me. It never will replace Colton, but it, it's, it feels good to have his best friend and almost his brother in the same house. It feels good. I know other mothers have their memories, their pictures. 
but to actually have something that you know your son loved and you can hold on to that every day, it has helped us tremendously. I'm living more now than I did before. Uh, being in a wheelchair, I, they say I'd never ski again. Guess what? I'm on a development team for the Paralympics. I ski a lot. One of the things I do is, um, I'm with the Women Veterans of New Mexico, so one of the things we do is have quarterly dinners and we get together. Yeah, over at the Senior Center, there's quite a few veterans over there, but there's, uh, I don't think there's any other women there except me that's been in the service. When we get together, we talk about our service, where we were, and the things we went through, because we have a unique experience as female veterans. Yep. I'm very close to my grandchildren. And as a matter of fact, uh, one of the principal reasons that I'm still big game hunting is because of my grandson. I'm a big recreational kind of guy. I love getting out with my kids and interacting with them and and really you know I cherish the ability to be able to do that because you know there was a long time I didn't think I was coming back it got really scary <laughs> you know? so knowing that that I am here I really don't take for granted the chances I have to interact with my children When I found out that we were going to go fishing on 11-11-11 for Veterans Day, the first thing I thought about was I got to take Michael. He loves to go fishing. He's a kid that loves the outdoors. I just knew that I had to bring him with me. My name is Jim Herring. I'm from Roanoke Rapids, North Carolina. I'm a member of Bravo Company 3rd Battalion, 20th Special Forces Group in the North Carolina Army National Guard. I'm married to Michelle, and I have two children, Michael and Samantha. My wife couldn't have kids, so I told her when we got married that we would adopt. It was difficult. I mean, we had a lot of miserable experiences trying to adopt kids, but fortune struck us and we adopted our first child, Michael. Two days old was the first time I held him in my arms, and it was all over for me. I loved him from that second, you know? Hey, look at that, one-handed. He's going, he got 40 feet to go, and he's gonna be coming in. Caught what? Oh! Where'd he go? He got off. How'd he get off? He got off. That's part of deal. Yeah! Did that warm you up? Yeah, that did, I feel great now. <laughs> That was a cheap, that was Ugh. whatever. I think he caught a tire. I've always wanted to be like my dad ever since I was young. You go every day wondering if uh, he's gonna come home alive or, or not. You have your good days and bad days. Oh, we're taking fire! You're in the National Guard like me, you know. You work with these guys all the time for years on end and you get to know their families, their children. So when you go to war with soldiers in the National Guard, they're like your brother, for real. And you do everything you can to take care of them. You don't know if he's gonna come back in one piece or if he's gonna come back at all. That was the hardest thing for me. I'd go days where I would, I think he was gone, that he wasn't gonna survive. And then. <laughs> yeah, baby! We're gonna share something together, sitting on the back of that boat, catching fish. Getting in them, Mike. Something that dads do. Dads and sons fish. Ah, he's coming up. We're gonna fish and we're gonna get in them and we're gonna tear them up. The last name Herring, what it means to me is um, a lot, yes. actually. My dad, with what he's done, it's a big name to live up to now. <laughs> this is the best ever. This is a great way to celebrate Veterans Day, a great way to celebrate him coming into my life me coming into his life. This is the best ever Veterans Day. Best ever.
Every day is Veterans Day out here. It's really beautiful. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what a great place to work. This is like my paradise. This is American Lake. American Lake VA golf course is sitting on the, the VA property right outside Fort Lewis. It's self-sustaining here. It's all volunteer. I love doing this kind of work. It's a lot of fun, and, and, and it's important. You dog, you. <laughs> Veterans, we're a close bunch. You know, it's like family out here. Look at that. Some of these guys just got back from Iraq. Oh, fuck. You know, we see them all the time come here. And some of them come here with injured legs, and they think it's all over. <laughs> Sorry. But it's not. <laughs> because they can do things they didn't think they could do. Like swing a club. I wanted to be a professional football player. I got injured. And I knew I was never going to do that. But if somebody could have said to me, hey, why don't you go grab a bag of, of clubs and go out and hit some balls, I can do that. <laughs> I've been deployed four times, three to Iraq, one to Afghanistan. A lot of the wounded, you don't see it. It's inside. I got nightmares. I have trouble sleeping. Um, a lot of just anger outbursts, uh, real high anxiety stuff like that. So I, I see a psychologist two or three times a week, I just try to manage myself and come out here when I'm feeling, feeling a little down and it totally gets me, bumps my morale up a little bit, so. Oh, nice. Should've been over there number eight. It's good to be out here and have fun, that's all it is. First of all, we care for our country and then we care for each other. Yep. And we can understand each other because we've all been through something and seen things in our life gotcha. that we don't even care to even talk about anymore. But when they come here, they, they know that, you know, everybody's for them. That's what this is really all about. Tacking off to the right again. To rehab our soldiers. Show off. <laughs> back into this crazy world. <laughs> that was nice. I've always felt that when I meet veterans, I, I view them in a different light, you know? When, when I meet people, even, even though I haven't known them previously, when I find out that they're a veteran, that I, I get an instant bond, you know, that, that we've sacrificed that we've given a little bit more than everybody else. There's a commonality with all veterans that uh, we sacrificed uh, our basic amendments that everybody else takes for granted. We gave them up because we gave up freedom of speech. We gave up uh, freedom, a lot of different freedoms to serve. You take World War II. Most of the people that were hitting the beaches at, on uh, D-Day and whatnot, most of those people were draftees. They weren't there because they, they wanted to be there. But they still did their job. Marble's a real small little town uh, in the rural part of Colorado in the Western Mountains. We have 85 people that live here. It's a very hardy group, very independent group that lives here. And we also have a quarry. I mean, many people uh, from the town have actually worked at the quarry before. Uh, my name is Gary Bascom. 
and I'm the superintendent of the Yule Marble Quarry in Marble, Colorado. I've, I've worked at the quarry for 21 years now. I love it here. My time in the Marine Corps uh, actually helped kind of guide me in what I'm doing now. That's yours, isn't it? Okay. It takes a lot of self-discipline to get up there and go every day, and you have to have a lot of uh, intestinal fortitude sometimes. Daniel, do you have a copy? Our job is a little bit difficult at times, a little bit uh, rough and rugged. What are you swiveling at? We're looking out for each other as a team, which is very important here. Like being in the Marines that helped prepare me for that and help guide the other men that I work with. And then I'll go in halfway and drop the saw down. Because sometimes they need a little bit of leadership or guidance to help get them motivated for the day. It's looking good, they're doing things right. That's what's important. We're pretty proud of uh, where all of our marble goes. It goes all over the world. Our main business for many years was actually the headstone business. I grew up in Iowa, uh, out in the country, worked on a lot of relatives and neighbors' farms, and that's kind of how I started. Uh, really wasn't prepared to do anything other than what I was doing. And one day got a postcard from the local Marine recruiter, and I was silly enough to fill it out and send it back in, and the next thing I know, he's calling me up, and uh, I'm going down to talk to him, and. He makes me go down to get my GED because I had dropped out of high school and went to boot camp, went to Paris Island, South Carolina, and uh, was in the Marine Corps for four years. Probably the best decision of my life. I actually needed somewhere where I could find out what I wanted to do in my life. I needed some direction, and the Marine Corps does help you do that for sure. They don't make your choices for you, but they give you the tools so that you can make your choices. I used to watch the newscasts even when I was younger, like eight to 10. And I used to watch it when they had uh, the body count on the news every Friday. And they would tell you how many men were killed and wounded over in Vietnam. I still see that today when they do it about Afghanistan and Iraq. So that's hard. This is where our uh, uh, Tomb of the Unknowns block is. It's right back inside here. 14 feet long, eight feet wide, and over six feet tall. This is our best quality out of the quarry, right here. The current tomb of the unknowns that's in Arlington National Cemetery right now uh, has a crack that runs the length and around the block. Washington uh, kind of put out feelers to different quarries to see if it was possible for any of them to come up with uh, a size block that would be a replacement and we came up with the entire thing. It's been here about five years now almost. This is quite a long time. We'd like to see it you know, be used in Washington if that's what their decision is. And unfortunately, it's all politics. This is a one-of-a-kind job. Now, I don't know anyone else that I've ever met that does something like this. I love it here. If you see the mountains that I work in, and I don't just work in the mountains, I work in a mountain. It's probably the one thing that I love the most. Veterans are protecting our way of life. And it's very important that everyone should appreciate that and know that uh, the time that any veteran gives helps us keep living the life that we live here and we're lucky to live in, this, in the United States. Morning, guys. Let's get in here and get warmed up. Let's go. One, two, ready, light.
Now back down. I'm Ron Duncan. I'm from Pleasant Hill, Ohio, and I'm a band director. I am a sergeant in the 38th Division Army National Guard Band in Indianapolis. I've served in the United States Marine Corps from 1993 to 97, and I served in the Army National Guard from 1997 to present. What are some of the traditions that your family has done to show your appreciation for what the veterans in the past have done for our country? A veteran, to me, is someone who is serving in our country or has served in the past and is passionate about what they do for this country. I play taps. I do that quite frequently for the 38th Division Band over there in Indianapolis. When I first joined the National Guard back in 97 when I got out of the Marine Corps, I went and played my first funeral with the National Guard down in Tennessee. The military uh, people that were there doing the funeral, they didn't realize I was coming. They had a boombox playing taps for uh, the family. There was a need for it because there was not enough of us uh, live buglers to go around. And so then they came up with the digital taps. It's a, actually a real bugle that has a insert that goes into the bell and you push the button and the sounds taps. And it's close, but uh, whenever you, you can get the uh, live taps, there's just so much more passion that's put into it. And family members can tell the difference. I was a young Lance Corporal up in Washington, D.C. in the Marine Drama Bugle Corps, and I was playing a funeral over in Arlington. And uh, a young Lance Corporal, same rank as me, had passed away, and he had a wife and one kid that was probably a year and a half, two years old. When I started playing taps, the little kid uh, ran out and stood right beside me and looked up at me as I was playing taps. I got it at that point. It wasn't about the musical performance. It was about the memories and the reflection of that family, what I was doing for them. I think that was one of those moments that changed my life and, and why I feel so passionate about the, what I do and what I teach my students. I want to read you something here. Just about every person over the age of 50 can tell you where they were, how they felt, and what they did upon hearing the news of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy on November 22, 1963. Sergeant Keith Clark, principal trumpeter of the U.S. Army Band, was going through his collection of rare books when he heard the Ready Report and immediately went to the nearest barber for a haircut, thinking he might be asked to sound taps to the chief executive be interred at Arlington National Cemetery. Never did the eloquent melody of taps created 100 years earlier during the Civil War have a larger audience than on Monday, November 25, 1963. Clark started the bugle call as he had done so many times. The notes resounded all over assembled, though in Clark's mind the call was only sounded for the widow, Jacqueline Kennedy. And on the sixth word, son, he cracked a note. It was recalled by author William Manchester, like a catch in your voice or a swiftly stifled sob. The cold temperature was not conducive to musical perfection. He finished the rest of the call perfectly. Clark saluted his commander in chief as the casket bearers folded the flag which was presented to Miss Kennedy. You never really get over it, Clark remembered in an Associated Press report in 1988 on the 25th anniversary of Kennedy's death. To do it then and to do it there, that's when the pressure comes. That's when it becomes difficult all of a sudden. We're not always asked to be perfection. Be perfection. And that's what he means by this. But we strive for perfection whenever we do anything that we do. Remember, guys, take time out today to remember those have, that have fallen for our country so that we can be free and we can do what we want to do. Okay? Have a great Veterans Day, guys. I wouldn't give up my three years in military for anything in the world because I think it was the best time at that time in my life.
I probably got more than I ever gave uh, out of the almost three decades that I spent in the, in the Navy. Hi, Hi ma'am. How are you? Have a flag. Happy Veterans Day. I joined the service at 17 years old, and I'm not ignorant anymore what sacrifice really, really means in every sense of that word. As we sit here and we're talking, there's men and women who might not come home tomorrow. Sir, how you doing today? Welcome home. It's, it's astounding just what every generation has had to give for America. It says here, Harris Drake, you served during World War II and you were in the Navy. He's right. Mm -hmm. I never forgot any of my friends we lost, you know, never will. People ask me all the time, knowing now what you know, would you go back, would you do it again? Absolutely. The people I met, the places I've been, the experiences, I am just proud to say I was able to serve.